Good afternoon everyone and uh, first of all thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm Mansi Sheikh. I work for a company called Veracore. It's a uh, cloud-based uh, application security company. Um, I work there as a security researcher. So my job is pretty much uh, find uh, security vulnerabilities in uh, modern framework stack theory. So I have a lot of background in hacking and stuff like that. So I'm not a developer by no means and I'm an excellent expert. I'm learning all these things right now, hearing a lot of things for the first time today. So please excuse me if my external knowledge is not as far as with you all. So at Veracode, uh, it's a startup. So we have a lot of problems to solve, a lot of innovative problems to solve. Uh, this is definitely not my field, but it all it became a very uh, interesting topic for me. Uh, it was a pet project for for my 20% uh, open-ended so open research time and I decided to use it for how we can use uh, analytics to work much more efficiently. So at the end of this talk, I expect that uh, you will have, you all obviously appreciate basics, but appreciate like how it can be used as an analytics tool for uh, doing a very deep, uh, in-depth analysis of XML algorithms. So, so first, I'm very curious how many of you have heard about Veracode like 30 minutes or 30 seconds ago? Has anyone heard about it? No. Okay. So it's an application security platform. We offer a lot of services. Uh, binary static analysis is how our startup started. So it currently also fetches around 80% of our business and that's where my research is going to. So I'm closest to that service and that's what I'm going to use for the rest of the talk. Apart from that, we have mobile security, we have some kind of a dynamic analysis going on. What is interesting about all these services right now is we all generate a lot of data, a lot of metadata which we want to persist and eventually start using it for to, to basically do our business much more efficiently. So, so basically we have started collecting lots of big data right now and I am going to just focus on some binary data, some basic, a small subset of metadata which we are collecting from binary static analysis service. So, this is one tool I have written. As a, as a researcher, constantly uh, I was in the business of wanting to know what kind of function calls are being used, how frameworks are used, how technologies are used across our clients, what kind of entry points are there, and I won't bore you with all the compiler stuff, but all those information. So this, and again, we deal only in uh, binaries of customers. We don't usually take, a, not usually, we never deal with source code. So just imagine gaining this information out of binaries is so difficult. We deal with different technology, different languages, different compiler versions of those languages, and so on and so forth. So this is an exploded version of a very simple uh, struts binary I have picked up from struts project. On the left hand side you see how complicated, the, how nested the whole architecture of a very simple application is. And then on the middle, uh, middle section of the screen is where I'm just using a class file and trying to show what information is important to us. It, I, it, I'm interested in the namespace where the class is, I'm interested in what the inheritance of that class is, I'm interested in what APIs are being called from every single functions defined in this class and so on. The next section is about a simple configuration file. For that, I'm, most of the modern applications are based on XML configuration files. So I would be interested in knowing how the actions are mapped, how the servlets are mapped, all those things. So now how does this map to XML world? So for example, again taking the same basic class binary version of it, I'm trying to extract where the namespace is, like if you see the first element is the class name and the namespace has been persisted so far and then what is being inherited, from where this class is being inherited into the functions defined and all the APIs called in this function. And this way I go across every single class file and next is I go through every single XML file defined, so all the configurations which I am interested in extracting. So how a simple configuration, so for, from this snapshot of a stretch config, I'm just interested in how the actions are mapped. So if I just pick up the action mapping and what are the corresponding action classes being mapped and how I'm mapping it to a single XML fragment. This way I go across every single binary submitted to us and every single 
uh, archives inside those binaries and every single class files, XML files, JSP files, you name it, and I start extracting things like this. And I start dumping it into XML fragments. This is how the final XML file will look like for me. Now, so this shows like where is the, what is the name of the archive, what classes are being defined inside it, what inheritance, function calls, and so on and so forth. Uh, similarly from configuration files. Now, most of our use cases was picking up information about API calls, which if you see, this is a very simple archive. If you see, it will be typically at the level of either the fifth level nested inside or the eighth level or how deep the archive is based. But that was the most common scenario. So we had options of uh, representing this data in various other formats, JSON, text, even CSV for that matter. But I thought XML was the right version because I did not, I really wanted to use the uh, query technologies and since data is hierarchical and that is the structure I wanted to retain, I chose XML. Uh, now, our customer, we have around 775 customers across the globe. Most of them are like, one, one third of them are Fortune 500 companies ranging from big financial companies to healthcare to public sector. They write huge and crazy applications. So, I mean, I don't know if you are one of them here is uh, associated with any such companies, they might know what I'm talking, what size of applications I'm talking, to, uh, talking about. Like, we, it's a very typical day for, see, for us to see a 200 gig of uh, binaries we are analyzing. So, on an average, I retain around 10 MB of metadata per submission per analysis we are doing. And we see around 300 applications submitted to our cloud service a day. So a day I'm talking about 3 GB. And that way we have 5 days a week and 52 uh, weeks a year. So one terabyte is only about the small section of metadata I'm retaining out of just one of our services. And then for just multiply for around 7 of our services, 2 of new services are coming in the way. So we are talking about a lot of data. Not everything we retain, not everything we retain in XML, but this is the kind, this is the uh, amount of data we are trying to talk about. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Am I understandable? Am I am I still with you? Okay, cool. So now, what are we going to do with all this data? So just just going through some of the basic use cases we currently have. So have you have? I'm just curious. Have, has anyone heard about a hard bleed, a shell shock, vulnerabilities, ghost? Okay, cool. So just imagine the day when those things were disclosed. We must, a lot of people in our company must have spent a lot of sleepless nights just to find out and isolate the customers who are vulnerable to that. Because ultimately, what comes down out of this vulnerabilities is the actual API, if the actual vulnerable API is being called by our customer binary or not. That simple question. And just to answer that question, we might, a lot of times we had to just rerun the whole thing which, which took days and weeks for just for us customers to get back to them. If we had a very mature prototype of this version going on, it would be in a matter of minutes. Because ultimately we just had to query, give us the function, give us the customer who is vulnerable to this particular API call and, and the story ends. So it was, it could have been historically the fastest uh, rapid response for us. Next, as I said, we have lots of customers and we also have to keep ahead in the game. So we have to keep a very uh, close eye on what developers are using, what is going on in the marketplace. So we have to generate a lot of prevalence data, like what should we support next. And it should be mapped over roadmap so that we can better support our customers and better be future proof for it. So we can, with this kind of data, we can very easily generate as much prevalence data charts to our hard contents for different technologies, different tier of technologies, different frameworks, and you name it. And our, and our product managers will be happy with that. And it's, it's honestly it's much more data centric way to do business. Next, as a researcher, my day, my, I'm constantly I'm looking for like the frameworks which I'm supposed to support or research next, and honestly, the support research which we have currently even implemented in our service, we constantly need to know okay where are the entry points, where are the, where are the tainted sinks, where are the tainted sources, all those things, so that it can directly map to our 
security scoping for that particular uh, framework. For that, this tool is awesome. This really gets the job done for us. So, once when we started collecting all this data, we obviously tried a lot of other things to get uh, good information out of it. Some of the approaches are listed here. Honestly, did not, not everything, in fact, I was not happy with any of these. Either they were repeating XML files as normal text file and streaming through data, or they were like parsing XML files for every single query and firing, or, or the data had to be represented in an alternate format, which kind of destructs the entire structure of the data I was trying to process. Even NoSQL, for that matter, it was like I, I was forced to do everything in JSON. It was very JSON friendly and nothing much XML friendly, but then one lucky day we I came across native XML databases and I kind of met you all guys there. So, um, after the whole uh, journey of uh, knowing what kind of metadata we are trying to process, what kind of use cases we are trying to achieve out of those metadata and the approaches we already tried, I kind of came up with this mini wish list just to get going a, a re relatively mature prototype. So first thing I really wanted is it should store the past XML files and not get into the business of passing XML files for every single file, every single query for that matter. I really wanted to use the querying technologies of XML and kind of did not want to reinvent the wheel with whatever alternate approach I might have tried. I mean I really thought XPath, XQuery are pretty powerful for the, for the most basic use cases and also future proofing it. And I, I wanted the results in a reasonable time frame. Like few approaches I tried, I fired a query, forgot about it for two days, and by the time I got the query result back, I almost forgot what I was queried before. <laughs> I, I, I really wanted results in some kind of a reasonable time frame. So this is what the uh, what uh, ecosystem I set up for a pretty mature prototype right now. So I dump all these XML files I collect every single day in a particular folder and it's mapped to, to every single client ID. I have a import script which has some business logic in it but just to simplify it, it just picks up the XML files and pumps it as a Basex database. Now Basex had, had some limitation on number of nodes per database and it could quickly be overcome by just creating different instances, uh, just uh, going on with the number of databases, just creating a new database for that. Pretty easy. Then, I use xQuery scripts, very basic ones, as I said, I have no experience in xQuery before like two months. So very basic xQueries could get through most of our use cases very quickly. So that's what I use for uh, querying the data outside the database. I use the interface of a REST API and I have a simple uh, Python Flask based uh, single page application which I currently call as my security analytics platform as you will see and it is just a wrapper around the REST API. As simple as that ecosystem and it works beautifully. Now we are a security company, I am a security researcher so I breach security every single day. So security definitely did not want to be an after afterthought for the whole thing. So the so few places where I have currently thought about security, uh, starting from security analytics platform is a I have a very good data validation routine going on there. It's it's custom, so but it works. It is at least, uh, at least going to block any obviously bad characters in it. We were always very sure it is never going to be a uh, customer facing uh, ecosystem. It's always going to be an inter internal ecosystem. So the threat model is a little different, but still it's quite basic. <coughs> REST API is on HTTPS, we have our own sorts going on. And for the database, it's uh, currently hosted in a Amazon EC2 instance. So we have, uh, I could not get, uh, say, uh, data security at rest is some feature I've been requesting, but it's a different story. Uh, so I have a very strict uh, access control on uh, Amazon EC2 instance, because always we are going to be facing questions legally, like who owns that data, and so on and so forth. So like uh, the SSH access to that uh, instance is uh, only allowed through a particular IP addresses in, through our VPN. The REST API is exposed only with an EP, uh, VPN. So practically it's a very locked down area. So this is very simple basic things currently we are doing for security. Any questions so far on the architecture we are trying to do? Okay. 
this is a very simple uh, X query I wanted to show, and especially because this is pretty much the algorithm I'm using from for all the use cases I have. Run the expo path, which I pass through a command a command line across every single document in every single database, and return the results back. And there is some post processing happening based on the use case, but this is pretty much what I'm making the X query files do for me. At this point, uh, what I have done is, uh, I wanted to show all the use cases we are trying to do against the ecosystem we have and show how it is working. And I am starting by uh, showing a classic uh, OS command injection vulnerability and how we are safeguarding our clients. I obviously could not use our uh, customer data for this, so what I did is I picked up around uh, 50 to 60 uh, open source uh, JWW applications for running through these use cases. I, I just run the demo, again because it was all VPN and all, I did not want to do a live one because I did not know the internet uh, situation here. Now I'm going to show you some simple use cases which we touched upon earlier. Let's start by seeing a classic OS command injection vulnerability in instructs to application. The beauty of this vulnerability lies in the query stream we pass. Can you zoom this a little for you? So as you can see, I'm passing a simple arithmetic expression as part of the query stream. Now let's see what we get back. We have nothing in the application. The beauty always lies when you see the page source for it. Let me zoom just what we get back. Okay. Interesting so far. Hmm. 700 which is 300 plus 400. This proves that that particular arithmetic expression was run on the server side and we got results back. This is a classic way of exploiting any OS command injection vulnerability. Now after a little bit of digging inside stressful framework, we quickly concluded that the culprit of this vulnerability is the action mapping where the action is mapped as a star, which is a default action mapper parameter. So our next step was figuring out which clients of ours are uh, vulnerable to this particular insecurity in stress to framework. So for that, we landed up in our security analytics uh, application, which currently is just a single page. It has two sections, a simple section and an advanced section. Simple section is where you want to find some basic uh, standard information of a namespace. And XPath and the advanced section is where you can actually execute a long, uh, long XPath as you need. So for this, I had crafted a simple XPath, not simple, but a fairly long XPath to get, get hold of our vulnerable customers. Let me zoom this a bit. So the way this export goes is for all the archives submitted by a customer and the classes which contain an XML, that means an XML is a configuration file and it has a function called action mapping and if the value of that function is a star, get me a list of all such customers. Let's see what we get now. Wow. So we quickly isolated our vulnerable customer. This is historically the quickest rapid response we could have ever achieved. Next, our PMs have a job of uh, making sure what are the latest uh, frameworks uh, most famously used by developers and also uh, having a, a prevalence of which frameworks are most commonly used across our customer base. Just, as, just for the sake of this demo, I collected all the major uh, MVC frameworks of a Java paradigm and kind of found a prevalence across our 50 open source uh, test applications. So from that, we can see that Spring MVC frameworks are used in 16 applications out of 50. Struts 1 is used in 11, Struts 2 is used in 2, in two applications. So from this we can see that Spring MVC is the most famously used framework across, across our customer base. So now the way this works behind the scene is, we again have a simple X query file. 
which takes input as a namespace and returns number of times that particular namespace is used across our customers. And that's pretty much the prevalence data we are looking for. So after this information maps into a road map, uh, product managers come to us researchers and say that, hey guys, look, Spring MVC is the most used framework across our customers, so let's do our best to support it as fully as we can and tame the beast a little. So at that point, we researchers, we go back to this particular security analytics uh, platform again and start collecting some basic information about our Spring framework, for example. So at this point, we are trying to collect that, okay, give us all the usage patterns of this particular names in space and let's see what we get back. So we see around 80 classes or 80 APIs are being used from this particular namespace. And what are those? Okay, it says that this particular servlets are being used. Uh, then it says, uh, it lists all the tags being used inside this framework. It tells us, uh, us around which view parts are being used, which multi part uh, classes are being used. You get an idea. Now this information maps into our security scoping and this way we can support maximum customers in our initial offering. Hopefully by this, by this use cases you get an appreciation of how we are using the, uh, the Azure XML data, database ecosystem using simple XQuery scripts for achieving some of our most important use cases. Any questions? Does that make sense? Uh, this is some stats I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, so I have I have tested this entire ecosystem uh, with around 500 users of data so far and I have tried it with uh, one standard query I kept for collecting all the stats. The, the result of the query was around 16 million records. I could not capture the bytes but it was 16 million records. Uh, and I got back the results in 64 minutes and this is without any post processing which I could have done it in xQuery so that could have also saved us time. I know this is not ideal uh, and we were never with this kind of data uh, set, we were never looking for any real time performance here, but it works beautifully for us. I mean, I, I am just psyched that even this is not cracking out on me. Honestly, I mean, I know we could have, I could have still, I have still a lot of optimizations to do. I mean, it can get better, but it works for us. Uh, Wishless, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I really wanted security at rest, but I know it's a huge field and not a lot of other NoSQL databases also offers that. But when we are talking about uh, pushing this in Amazon, it, ca it can't be scaled on my laptop anymore. It has to be on Amazon. We are already looking at S3 NetApps for that matter too. But so eventually we are going to start to take this question hard, like how can we protect this at rest? Right now we don't have any backups also in, uh, um, Backups also enabled just because we did not want this data outside of our uh, access control means. I mean, ideally, it would be best if for every single query the data is encrypted and decrypted back to us. But that's going to take a huge performance hit. And that's why my next research item is if we can have distributed processing to do this for us. This is a simple wish list, but I know it's not going to happen in the near future. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the Vera Code guys are great. Uh, you guys are great, and I won't be here without any of you. All. That's it. Uh, this is the best way to reach me. I have pushed a lot of code I have used in this ecosystem and this slide deck on uh, this GitHub repository. It's pretty much my Twitter name, so it's easy. Any questions? Thank <laughs> you.